Spirit, still my body. Spirit, wake my soul. I can't tame tomorrow. Now need be my goal. Spirit, still my body. Spirit, wake my soul. Steep me in the present. The rest God will control. Spirit, still my body. Spirit, wake my soul. I can't tame tomorrow. Now need be my goal. Spirit, still my body. Spirit, wake my soul. Steep me in the present. The rest God will control. Good morning and welcome to this sacred space. My name is Lydia and I am joining you from Marquette, Michigan. And this is the worshiping community for the Episcopal Diocese of Northern Michigan. Each week we start with a collect from Prayers for an Inclusive Church by Stephen Shakespeare. And this week is Trinity Sunday. Our collect today is Trinity of Love, deposing the powers of hate and isolation, gathering creation in bonds of mutual care through the waters of baptism, may our relatedness be reborn in justice, mercy, and peace through Jesus Christ, who is with us always. Amen. i 
children's liberty with the Spirit's gifts and powers for the work of ministry. Lord, you show us love's true measure. Father, what they do forgive, yet we hoard as private treasure all that you so freely give. May your care and mercy lead us to a joy. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. The eleven disciples went to the hill in Galilee where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, though some of them doubted. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to be, obey everything I have commanded. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. This week, we are excited to welcome April Stace as a guest preacher. April is the Affiliated Professor of Arts and Pastoral Care at General Seminary. She also serves as Director of Spiritual Formation at Brooklyn First Presbyterian Church. She lives in New York City with her partner, Lou, and her son, Luke. And we are so grateful for April's message this morning. Friends, I greet you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So here we are, just over five months into 2020, two and a half months into a global pandemic that has slowed or stopped so much of life as we know it, three weeks into a steady stream of protests and riots against racism, and 400 years or so into a long history of colonization and violence against people of color that was often justified, of course, using passages from the Bible or church authorities. That's a lot. And if you're like me, you might be feeling like, are we done yet? Can we get off this carousel? But this carousel has been going around for a very long time. I don't need to tell you that. And we're all pretty dizzy this year, unable to always figure out what the next right step is, whether it's the next step with your young kids at home who are so tired of online school. Although I think in Michigan, your school year's over. Um, here in New York, it stretches for another three weeks. So maybe that's not relevant anymore, I'm not sure. Um, or whether it's with your employment situation, your health, uh, maybe you're really feeling it around educating yourself about racism and social action. There's a lot going on and many of us don't know the next right step to take. So if that's you and you feel dizzy and a little exhausted from it all, 
What I would like you to hear this morning is that you are in very good company. In fact, you're in the company of the first disciples of Jesus. This group of followers at the time of our lectionary reading for today has just been through the whirlwind of their lives. They've taken several years to follow this brilliant rabbi around, um, learn from him, been so changed, then seeing him be taken by the authorities, watching him die, losing their hope, seeing him resurrected and not being sure what to make of it, finally getting convinced, and then getting the instructions that are our reading for today which we often call the Great Commission. <clears throat> it's this instruction from Jesus to go out um, and make disciples on his behalf throughout the nations to teach people and, and show people the way of Christ. One of the complicated things about this text is that it's actually been used historically to justify terrible acts of power on behalf of the church and Christian countries. Jesus tells his disciples to go out and make disciples in all the world. And this was radically misunderstood. I would say probably willfully misunderstood in many cases to go out to mean to go out and force everyone to go to church or pay taxes to the king or provide in many circumstances slave labor so that white people could live more easily. I'm sure that you agree with me. That's probably not what Jesus was talking about. I mean, some of the worst violence in recent history was justified with the verses that we read today. But it's also some of the most direct teaching that we hear from Jesus in the Bible. So again, it's a little dizzying. What do we do with this commandment from Jesus to go out and make disciples when we know how grossly interpreted it has been in the past? It's part of the bigger question, right? In a world where so much good is mixed with so much bad, how can we, as disciples and disciple makers, be good? What does it mean to be good when the land we stand on was stolen from indigenous peoples? When the wealth of the country some of us are citizens of was built on the backs of slave labor of black and brown people? What does it mean to be good in this situation? Well, here's the thing. It's a little secret that I love about Jesus. It's actually not a secret. It's just something we often forget. Most of the time when people ask Jesus questions around how they could be good, he wasn't really that interested in their question. Think about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus to ask him how he could be worthy of heaven. And after a little dodging, Jesus gave him an answer that was so far beyond what he felt capable of that he just left. Think about the story of the woman accused of adultery um, with the other leaders challenging Jesus to name in that situation who was right and who was wrong. And of course, don't forget my favorite quote from Jesus. When he answers someone who addresses him as good teacher, he answers, why do you call me good? Only God is good. So you see, Jesus had a mixed relationship with being good, probably was not one of his top concerns. He was interested in something else. And if we look at the lives of the disciples and what Jesus asked of the disciples, we see that being good is actually not a huge part of being a follower of Jesus, or at least it's not the top priority. And this is what I want to suggest this morning, that being a disciple isn't about being good, at least not primarily. It's about being real. You know, often we religious folk have a reputation of prioritizing good over real or good over human. We want people to live right. Don't be impolite. Don't step out too far. Don't stay out after curfew protesting police violence, which is something that's happening a lot here in New York. Don't forget to say please and thank you. There's nothing wrong, of course, with being polite or nice and saying please, and I'm not advocating that we as Christians should stand against those things. But when we stop there, we miss the point that the Great Commission isn't about being good. It's not about people falling in line. It's about being human. When people make the choice to be fully human, to be real, to be vulnerable, everything can change. 
That is so much of what we are seeing today in the streets and cities and towns around our country and around the world. Being real, being human, this is actually what changes the world. And this, my friends, is actually what's at the beginning of the church. This is the beginning of all that we do here. Our singing, our committee meetings, our rituals, it all started with this moment of clarity of one human being looking at another human being in the eye and saying, me too. I was there too. I saw him too. And to know together that beautiful and terrible things are happening in this world, but that we can be together in it. Of course, the truth is that we are all raised with sets of rules. I don't need to tell you this. Each one of us here was brought up with a particular idea of what it means to be good, what it means to be free, what it means to trust or for something to be sacred, what it means to be successful. All of these things are things we pick up in our families and our culture from a very early age. Some of what we are raised into actually is good. Other parts of it aren't. And we're all tasked through life with figuring out our own definitions for what is good and what is free and what is sacred. So if that feels dizzying to you, if you're looking at all the things you've been taught and are wondering what parts of it are good, what parts of it are real, here's one really quick checkup we can all do when we're not sure about our own discipleship. Any rule that we have, any goal that we have, any ideal that we are trying to live up to, if it helps us stand in the presence of another human being and truthfully say to that person, I'm here with you and I see you and I'm going to let you see me and I'm just a person trying to figure this all out like you, then you're on the right track. You are on the discipleship highway. But here are some other ways to think about it. If the ideal that you are trying to live up to, to be, say, a good parent, is standing in the way of you actually knowing and understanding your children and letting yourself be known by them, then I hope you can hear God saying, you don't have to be good. If the ideal you are trying to live up to as a good person means that you never say to another human being, I'm struggling, then I hope you can hear God saying, you don't have to be good. And if the ideal you have in your mind of being a good Christian means preserving the ways that we've always done things, even to the point of preferring that people leave if they don't like it, I hope you can hear God saying, you don't have to be good. If your idea of being a good white person, for those of you who are white, means to try to stay out of trouble, stay out of conversations where you might make a mistake, stay out of deeper relationship and all of the challenges that come with interracial friendship and relationship. If your being good is getting in the way of you being real and being in relationship and really hearing from your friends and families and coworkers what it's like for a person of color right now, then I hope you can hear God saying, you don't have to be good. So how do we hold this together, our own discipleship? With the call from Jesus to go out into the nations and make disciples. Well, let me tell you, it is hard, if not impossible, to tell people about your vulnerability, to tell people that you are a human, to tell people that you've had a life-changing experience with God. So here's the really good news about going out and making disciples. We're not really called to go out and talk about it. We're not usually called to just go out and tell people about it. Our call is actually harder. We're called to be it. So here's the bad news. Being with and in the spirit of life is both the easiest and the hardest thing to do. It's easy because it doesn't mean you have to have all the answers. You don't have to fake it like you do. You don't have to know what is good. It's hard because it means you have to learn how to tolerate not having the answers and not relying on faking it like you do. 
It means you have to learn to tolerate your own humanity, your own vulnerability. It means learning how to live without illusions of power. It means learning how to live without the illusion that being good somehow makes us worthy of love. So I hope you can hear this today. You are worthy of love. You do not have to be good. You have a higher and more difficult calling. You do not have to be good. You have to be human. With God's help, may we all continue to take steps into our own humanity. Amen. Blessing in a time of violence, which is to say, this blessing is always, which is to say, there is no place this blessing does not long to cry out and lament, to weep its words in sorrow, to scream its lines in sacred rage. Which is to say, there is no day this blessing ceases to whisper into the ear of the dying, the despairing, the terrified. Which is to say, there is no moment this blessing refuses to sing itself into the heart of the hated and the hateful, the victim and the victimizer, with every last ounce of hope it has. Which is to say, there is none that can stop it, none that can halt its course, none that will still its cadence, none that will delay its rising, none that can keep it from springing forth from the mouths of us who hope from the hands of us who act, from the hearts of us who love, from the feet of us who will not cease our stubborn aching, marching, marching, until this blessing has spoken its final word, until this blessing has breathed its benediction in every place, in every tongue, peace, peace, peace. And now I invite you into a moment of prayer you are above us, O God, you are beneath. You are in earth, you are beside us, you are within. O God, you are in the betrayed and suffering people of our world, just as you were in the broken body of Jesus. We pray now for all that concerns us. Let us offer our prayers, both spoken and unspoken. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. All along my pilgrim journey, I want Jesus. Talk with 